Hell is Cinema Back, created by she, her, continued by he, him. How we doing out there? Good, great, grand, and, 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 wonderful. We're back for the love of cinema, baby, for the love of cinema. As you see on your screen, your dial, however you're joining me today, I appreciate it. You know I do, to a certain extent. <clears throat> the more you appreciate, the more shows I have to do. It's bittersweet, because, yeah. Yeah, I'm starting to take uh, some of these things that uh, all my uh, peers in the biz, well, I shouldn't say the podcasting biz, but the cinema world, <laughs> a couple cinematographer, director, actor friends, they're just like, do you really do all this shit for free? Answer, yes. <laughs> yes, I do. I know uh, distributors think, you know, uh, oh, well, if I send them a disc... You know, that's that's form of payment. Well, I guess I agree with that to a certain extent. To a certain extent. On the other hand, I uh, I try to put some time into these. Try to entertain you a little bit. And I, I suppose the entertainment's got to be worth something, right? Anyway, as you see, Death Screams. Yeah, we went uh, all out for that original title. I'm kidding. I mean, Death Screams is actually known by uh, it known by a few titles. Um, Death Screams, and I believe House of Death, and then there was a couple of other ones. So this one, um, you know, sometimes we bring back these ones, and I've heard uh, Joe Bob Briggs uh, talk about it before. And if you don't know who Joe Bob Briggs is, uh, we can't be friends. So. Um, But I've heard him talk about uh, something similar to this before, where we are in this weird time over the past, like, five to ten years, where we are trying to bring back a lot of these old films, cult films, and some of them not cult films, and I definitely would not classify this one as a cult film, but, like... He was, he goes on to basically, and I'm paraphrasing, but he goes on to say that, like, you know, some of these don't need to be brought back. Some of these films don't need a remastering. Some of these films don't need to be brought out of the grave um, for uh, the masses to enjoy. Now, on some level, I I, I don't, I can't remember off the top of my head what recent one um, that, that would fit the bill. Until this one, so I mean, you know, I mean, but uh, to be fair, like a lot of the stuff that I have been talking about lately, you know, they these people were big beforehand. But I, mean, I, I digress. I digress. Um, this one, I <laughs> I have now watched it twice, and the bonus features. I'm struggling to see the the uh, the attraction to it. That's not to say that it's a bad movie. It's not. It's not to detract. Um, from the people that worked on it. Like I said, you know, this is old days. You know, this is not going out with your iPhone now. You know, this is back when you were still shooting on film. You know, this is well before digital. So I'm not going to be an asshole uh, fully, you know. There needs to be some merit on what, uh, there needs to be some merit given on what it took to, you know, make films. I mean, I can be as simple as before digital, you know. And, And, you know, there's... Real editors, not that the new editors are relax any editors that are listening. I'm just saying the old school. You know what I'm talking about. Fucking taping and gluing uh, negatives together with a cigarette hanging out of your mouth. The, the, the real editors know. So I will give props that, you know, it's hard to make a movie and Death Screams got made. So let's start with that. But I, I guess... <laughs> Here comes I I was surprised, you know, like I said, Joe Bob Briggs has been like, why do we bring back this, that and the other thing? He may even said it something about like dead and Barry. No, no, I don't think he said it about dead and Barry. But um, this is the first time that I've come across it where I was just like, what are we doing here? <laughs> wait, wait a minute. So let me. OK, let me tell you a little bit about what the film is about. And then I'll tell you some of my some of the things where I was just like, what's happening? So Death Screams, a.k.a. House of Death. At midnight, all you will hear are death screams. That's not true. We don't play on the whole timing thing. It's not like <clears throat> the maniac comes out at midnight. So I don't know what's happening. Um, but you know what? Let's try a little something here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Cool. A razor-sharp machete wielded by a madman 
cuts through the night, cuts through the night mist, leaving dismembered bodies scattered about. The police are baffled by these sadistic killings and are helpless to stop them from happening again. What was once a small, quiet town is now engulfed in fear, terror, and shock. The blade is being sharpened again, as a group of college students, unsuspecting of the brutal killings, are planning a party. Of course they are. The deranged killer is planning to have a party of his own. Join him if you dare. <laughs> so... Uh, Death Scream stars, what do we got here? We got Susan Kiger, who plays Lily, Larry Sprinkle, who plays Ted, Andrea Savio, who plays Kathy, David Lenthal as Jackson, Martin Tucker as Coach Neil Marshall. Uh, it made me happy to see the name Neil, Neil Marshall. Why? Think, horror fans. William T. Hicks as Sheriff Avery, who is pretty funny. John Kohler as, get this character name, Diddle. One more time for the people in back. Joe or John Kohler as Diddle. Jennifer Chase as Ramona. Jody K as Sandy. Kirk Rector as Bob. Josh Gamble as Tom. Hans Man uh, Manship as Casey. Casey was a interesting character. Helene Tyron as Edna Sharp. She was, I mean, just as classic as a old lady would be. Mary F uh, Mary Fran Lehman as Agnes Bottomley. Yes, Agnes Bottomley. Mike Brown as Walker. Monica Boston as Sheila. Hold oh, on, we're not done yet. Sharon Alley as Sarah. She was also on the bonus features. Penny Miller as Angie Maloney. Baloney. Angie Maloney. Uh, Bill Eisen as Arch Johnson. Gail Mitten as Brenda. R.C. Uh, I guess plays R.C. Anyway, um... So, let's not <clears throat> bash all those that were involved. Now, some of the ladies that were involved, they were playmates. They were playmates that uh, uh, producer Charles Eisen, Eisen, Charles Eisen, Eisen, uh, brought on to be a part of the slasher. Now, uh, this film was directed by David Nelson and written by Paul C. Elliott. Um, we will get to the bonus features in a minute here, but it sounds like they changed up Paul's script quite a bit, quite a bit. Uh, cinematography by Daryl Keth Kethcart, Kethcart, Daryl Kethcart, edited by Jerry Whittington, and music by D. Barton. Now, you know what? You know what? I didn't mind the music. I thought the music was pretty good. Um... The cinematography, so I kind of go back and forth on the cinematography in Death Screams. There are some times where it is almost uh, impossible to see what is going on. Now, let's start with the opening scene, okay? I believe um, Paul, Paul C. Elliott, the writer, said that uh, the the couple that you see get slain in the beginning. Look, it's a horror film from the 80s. I'm not ruining too much for you. Uh, to start off the story, a couple gets slain. Am I really telling tales out of here? You know I like to keep things a surprise for you. But if you're walking into a 1980s, uh, I mean, like if you were to Wikipedia, it says clear. Oh, it's also called Night Screams, too. Death Screams, House of Death, and Night Screams. Um, but if you walk into uh, a film from 1982 that is classified as a slasher, you're probably going to see a little bit of blood or a little bit of caro syrup, caro syrup and red food coloring, and you're probably going to see some pips. Yeah, so you're going to see people slaying and some pips. But <clears throat> back to the cinematography. Um, and obviously at the time... Um, this is a lot easier, uh, a lot harder to do. Um, so be positive, be positive. The one thing that I really enjoy about the, the look and the aesthetic of Death Screams, it's pretty dark, man. It's pretty dark and grainy. Now that could have had something to do, um, with the remastering of it and the colorists working over at Arrow Video. Arrow Video's release of Death Screams. Arrow Video. Uh, neck and neck with the best in the business, baby. I go back and forth. Criterion Arrow. Criterion Arrow. Arrow Criterion. Criterion Arrow. Um, so, I mean, it could have something why there are parts that 
stand out a little bit more. But again, you're you're blathering, Sean. Go back to the beginning and the two people that got killed. Okay, I will. I believe that they were supposed to have their throats their throats cut. Right now, we're not going to show the killer or anything like that. But they were supposed to have their throats cut. And what you end up seeing, you could make the argument. You could make the argument. So they're fooling around. They're fooling around, grabbing a titty, diddle in the hood. <laughs> what the fuck, Sean? Uh, I, hand, hand on the, hand on the member. They're fooling around. You could make the argument. I just can't believe I said the hood thing. Uh, you could make the argument that th- the shock of a train passing overhead is what killed the first two characters to set the in a small southern town i believe all of this was shot in north carolina a couple ted and angie are brutally murdered i don't believe that we mention the names ted and angie and if we do it is very briefly like a lot of stuff that's glossed over in this movie like you even do i kid you not you i would not be surprised if 30 to 40% of the people that watch this film are kind of confused at when you see who the killer is. Anyway, anyway. In a small southern town, couple Ted and Angie Angie are brutally murdered while having sex down by the riverfront and their bodies thrown into the water. So, as they're having sex, a train passes overhead and they die right there. Now... I believe what I heard in the bonus features on like the 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 bootleg 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 VHSs that got passed around for this particular movie. You couldn't really even see anything. Now in the uh, transfer from Arrow, which again looks marvelous as per usual, um, you see a a garrot wire wrapped around both necks of quote-unquote Ted and Angie, because I, I don't know if we specifically said that. I We might have. I don't know. Um, but uh, at least they may have said it to each other. Ted, Angie. Anyway, when the train goes overhead, they both, like, look up and shriek, and then you kind of see a little blood coming out of their mouth, and it is cut. Next scene. <laughs> and the first time I watched it, I didn't even see the, the Garrett wire um, wrapped around the neck. I, I didn't even say, like, I was just like, wait a minute, the, is the train so loud above above their head that they're now bleeding out of their mouths? <laughs> I was kind of confused, but giggling, you know what I'm saying? I like old, bad, good movies, and even the old, bad movies, I still, there's so much more fun to watch than, say, Sharknado. Sorry, sorry, kiddos, I am never getting on board with Sharknado. It's never going to happen. I, I it's it's wild. I I, th- I feel like I've been saying this for so long now, but like a year ago, I know I went on some fucking <clears throat> rant for twenty minutes about how Sharknado is not a bad good movie or a good bad movie. It's just a bad bad movie, right? So it, it, watching Death Screams, there are stuff where I'm just like, well, that's hilarious. It doesn't make any sense. Like I'll talk about one of the the deaths here and another one of the deaths where I was just like, what happened? (laughs) So, um, but, uh, like I said, with the first time I watched it, I thought the train went overhead and it was so loud that now they're bleeding from their mouths and then they die. And second time watching it. Okay. I saw the, uh, get up wire wrapped around both their necks. Interesting enough though, I don't know that you would be able to kill someone, even if you had paranormal Michael Myers strength, which um, it's not, there's nothing paranormal about this movie. So that's why, uh, I guess, if you find that a spoiler, fine, it's a spoiler. But there's nothing paranormal about this movie. It's more or less uh, deep-seated, dark issues stemming from a bad childhood to create a monster. You're I, actually you're listening to one right now. <laughs> terrible childhood. Well, I had a half of a terrible childhood. In fact, what I tell people is, one week I had a terrible childhood, and then the next week I didn't. And then one week because I would alternate visitation with my parents. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you who, but I will just say that you know. Anyway, uh, it would be kind of hard 
right? Somebody DM me, tell me I'm wrong. Wouldn't it be hard to wire, Garrett wire two heads together and kill them? I, I mean, even if paranormal the paranormal activity did exist in this, wouldn't that wouldn't that be hard? <laughs> Someone, anyone? I don't know. I so you know, again, I'm laughing, right? You know, not Sharknado laughing, but I, I'm laughing at the audacity of it. Um, now, some some of the writing. Let's give some props. I feel like I've been shitting. Okay, um, let's let's give it some of some props. Um, I really enjoyed that even for a movie that, again, you know, not a lot of money, not overly well done, um, I thought it kept you guessing even if even if when the killer does reveal himself, you're kind of like, what? I will say up until the, you know, most of the moments leading up to that, in terms of who the killer is, I thought Paul Elliott did a really good job at concealing it. You could make the argument for the first two-thirds of the movie, anybody could be the killer. And I and I like that. And that inc- includes um, <sighs> the, our lead, our lead playmate, Lily. Or even uh, one of the grandmas who's in a wheelchair and you see her get up from her wheelchair and walk around later in the film. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. Is this some Jason Voorhees shit? Is the mom pissed off? Um, yeah, the, the character of, uh, of Casey, played by Hans Manship, who is a learning disabled kid. Um, you know... <laughs> Uh, there's a scene in particular where I actually thought Hans's acting was pretty pretty good. Is when he's playing with a train set, which feels so cliche to sit like it was just we 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 thought differently back in the day. I feel like we we were like, oh, how do we make him look learning disabled? Well, we'll we'll have a grown man with a conductor's hat on and he'll play with his choo choo train. And I'm not saying it doesn't work. It does. But I almost feel like it was it was kind of lazy in a sense, or just like, oh, we'll make him just talk very, you know, and put a train set in front of him. Sold. He's learning to say bolt. <laughs> I know grown men that play with fucking trains. Of course, they maybe are learning disabled too. I, and if you have a train set out there, then look, paint your model trains, do your thing. You know, we all have different hobbies. Um. I don't know where I was going with it. I, I, I it was just it, even that character, though. Okay, because the character of Casey, the learning disabled kid, you see him. I shouldn't even say kid. They're all like they're you know they're late high school, early college students. But you know, like it was back in the day, all these people are like thirty and forty years old. So it's like when they keep referring to Casey, oh, you know, as a young adult, he looks like a thirty-five, forty-year-old man. <laughs> so, but he's he kind of creeps around. Uh, he's in the background for a lot of the movie. So the way that it's written. You could think Casey is the killer. Um, you could think, uh, uh, and I'm not going to reveal who because I think that's again one of the um, um, one of the good things about this film is kind of not knowing um, who it is nor motives. And we do kind of gloss over the motives, that's for sure. I'm kind of unclear, mainly because we didn't spend too much time on it. Now there is a little. Fuck, man, it can't be longer than seven to ten seconds to, I guess, give you some motivation of the killer. But even then, like, even when you watch it, you, you like, you got to stretch. You, 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 you're you like, wait a minute. So he, and that was, even though it was very unclear <laughs> heading into the ending, um... Yeah, so I did like playing the guessing game throughout all of it. I, I thought for a second maybe it was Mrs. Bottomley, or maybe Lily has lost her mind because of all the sexual advances. Or maybe, you know, it's the uh, class clown Diddle, who I'm surprised on some level they didn't get fucking sued. <laughs> because um, Diddle does like three or four... Uh, three Stooges impressions throughout this, mostly curly. Actually, it's just all curly. But he does a lot of... <laughs> so it's very 
<clears throat> Three Stooges, very uh, Abbott and Costello, but it was so on the nose that I was just kind of like, Jesus. Like, I mean, here's the thing. Like, if 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 copyright infringement didn't exist, by all means, go ahead. You know, if your character's kind of goofy and whatever, by all means, go ahead and fucking do a Three Stooges impression. But, like, when we got on the third one, and this is irrational, and I, most people don't watch film like this, and I I envy you for not uh, watching films like this, but I was sitting there going, oh, shit, somebody's about to get fucking sued, and then I have to remember that this movie came out almost 40 years ago. So <laughs> it was like, this is, this is odd, is it not? Actually, it'll be 40 next year. It'll be 40 years old next year. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's just a lot of oddness throughout it. Like the floating body, like the the two first bodies that are thrown and dumped them in the fucking river, uh, thrown in the river beginning. I don't even know what impression that was. I apologize, folks. Uh, I th- actually, I think it was in a song and then I dump them in the river. Um, <laughs> fuck. Uh, they, nobody seems to find them throughout the course of the film. And all these bodies start piling up in the stream and kind of get washed ashore, and I think there's like four or five of them at the end, and it's like nobody, nobody saw them for the because this film has covered a, a few days, a few days, um, had this random stuff. Uh, I think w- what was so hilarious is uh, I think Sharon Alley is the actress name. Her death, oh boy, it's so. <laughs> I was so confused. Like, I kid you not. I was like, fuck, man, did I eat an edible? Turns out I didn't eat an edible. And I was just very confused, and rightfully so. So Sharon, um, without giving too much of the plot away, I will just say she vandalizes someone's car, okay, and then runs off after vandalizing the car. This takes place at a carnival, okay? Actually, a lot of the movie um, is in the carnival, or at least eh, maybe a, a third of the movie is in a real-life carnival that they had found uh, not too far from where they were setting up shop. And so the carnival is alive and well, right? Sharon vandalizes a car, gets caught, and runs off. She runs off, near as I can figure it, like, they just threw, like, a, a bunch of trees or whatever, and then there's, like, rides on the other side of the foliage that just no one's using. So, and, and I don't know, if you're using your brain or if I had to guess that, you know, it was two different days of shooting, but she goes from a live and a, a live and well carnival, crosses foliage, and now she's at, like, another carnival, but none of the rides are going no one's there it's and this is daylight this is broad daylight okay and she kind of stops to take her breath at the entrance of the of the park actually it's it's quite a ways off and the only reason i bring this up is because she gets shot by an arrow (laughs) after she vandalizes the car just shot with an arrow we haven't seen an arrow the entire film we've only seen the blade of a machete the next thing we know she gets shot in the arrow or shot with an arrow in the back and i know the first thing that i would do after i got shot with an arrow in the back is i would run towards one of the vacant carousels that mind you was not uh, operating or on when this sequence started Okay, so the, the follow me now. The carousel is still, it's dead. It's not, it's not going anywhere. And I know that if I got shot with an arrow, uh, I would run to a, a, a carousel that's not working, and I would sit on one of the horses <laughs> on the carousel to catch my breath as I have this arrow in me. Uh, that's, that's what I would do. And then the carousel, before the carousel starts to move, she gets a plastic bag put over her head, and that's the end of her character. Now, ironically enough, we segue one of the most confusing sequences. Well, actually, the most confusing is the, the 
some of the stuff that happens in the last act. It's still fun to watch. Like it's def all of this shit is giggle worthy. You know what I'm saying? Like I was laughing throughout the not Sharknado laugh. I was laughing. You know, you get the idea. But I, I I'm sitting there laughing. But <laughs> ironically enough, we go from one of the weirdest sequences to one of the more eerie shots um, by cinematographer Daryl uh, Kithcart. I. When she's going around the merry-round dead with a plastic bag over her face, it is very eerie, right? And I think it would hold more weight is if prior, <laughs> it would have made sense. Like, how did she just go from a a a, a carnival that's popping, a fair that's popping, to just cross the thin layer of trees and now? There's nobody out there. There's no, you know, there's just, there's just a bunch of stuff throughout this film that I was just like, Haha, what happened? <laughs> so, um, all right, I think we're cool on that. But check this out: the the Arrow video release, brand new 2K restoration from archival, uh, from an archival 35 millimeter print. I wish we had theaters in my neck of the woods that still showed stuff on film. Fuck, it sucks, man. I would just be there all the time. Um, high definition presentation, original uncompressed mono audio, optional English subtitles, da, 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 brand new audio commentary by producer Charles Eisen and special effects artist Worth Keeter. Uh, you know, Worth Keeter, pretty good work uh, throughout this. It, I mean, it's brief, but pretty good work. I don't, I don't want to ruin it because a lot of the special effects he does are kind of big payoffs, so I don't... Not, not payoffs, but kind of. If there's one thing that you could gravitate to in this particular film, it is some of the special effects pieces. So let's not ruin those. Uh, audio commentary with producer Charles Eisen and special effects art, artist Worth Keeter, moderated by filmmaker Phil Smoot. Another audio commentary by The Hysteria Continues. Both those guys are they're fucking great. The Hysteria Continues. The Hysteria Continues. All the fun of the scare, which is a making of uh, for Death Screams, newly produced making of documentary featuring interviews with producer Charles Eisen, special effects artist Worth Keeter, writer Paul Elliott, actors Hans Manship and Kirk Rector. Kirk Rector's wild, man. I don't know where they, I would assume, like as an apartment or whatever, but he's sitting on a couch with like two very fluorescent colored pillows and the pillows have pictures of schnauzers on it. It was really wild. It kind of initially it kind of took me out of the interview. I just couldn't stop staring. I was like, what the, where are we shooting this? Um, uh, I'm going to, I'm a Kurt Rector uh, producers, assistant and assistant supervising editor, Sharon Alley, who I just talked about her hilarious death, uh, talent wrangler, Robert Billy Bob Melton. And also TV and uh, TV and radio spots, image galleries, House of Death alternative VHS opening titles. I won't give that away uh, for you because it's completely different than the uh, the film itself. The intro, two versions of the screenplay under the original title of Night Screams and Reversible Sleeve Art. Bah, 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 bah. You know they always give you the goodies at fucking Arrow posters and. Lobby cards and yep, da 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 da. I mean, I just cracked <clears throat> the uh, Legend Blu ray, Tom Bruce, Ridley Scott, the Legend Blu ray. That had so much stuff in it. I just wish I had the fucking. I wish I just had the space to put all some of it, but I don't know that I would. I don't know that I would. Death Screams Arrow video release. Got some fun stuff coming up for some of you. Not me. It takes more work. Death Screams Arrow video release available now. Available now. Ellis Cinema. Oof. I need a break, guys. I need a fucking break, dog. For the love of cinema, baby. Ellis Cinema. For the love of cinema. Death Screams Arrow video. Get it now. Stream it first. If you so choose. But come on, let's keep physical media in the game, baby. Let's keep physical media in the game. Quality's better. 
Sorry, streamers. Quality's better. Video presentation, audio presentation, it's better. Physical media, Ellis Cinema. Death Screams, Arrow Video, we gone. Thank you.